I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Church family, would you please grab your Bible, turn it to Genesis chapter 32, continue walking through the book of Genesis, and we again today still find ourselves in the life of Jacob. I've been asking the question a lot this week, Lord, why so much time with this guy? Because I don't know about you, but I'm just kind of thinking, why are you such a knucklehead? Why are you so frustrating as an individual in scripture? And why so much time being devoted right here? You know, you ask the Lord things and then he shows you things. And the Lord really convicted me. The reason I'm so frustrated with Jacob is because I'm so much like Jacob. I'm stubborn. The Lord shows up in amazing ways and convicts me through his word and he teaches me. And then I go off and do the same foolish things that I've done before. Yet God in his grace continues to pursue me continues to pursue me in my field, continues to pursue Jacob. Man, how encouraging it is to see God's faithfulness. When he has called someone, what he will begin in them, Philippians 1, 6, he will bring it to completion when you are his son and his daughter. But there comes this moment in Jacob's life today in Genesis chapter 32 that proves to be a huge turning point. I love that song, Who You Say I Am, as we're about to step into this text because God is about to rename Jacob to Israel. But before we jump into 32, we need to be reminded a little bit about where we've come. A lot of stuff has happened. So let's back up. All the way back in Genesis 25, God places his covenant promise upon Jacob. He chooses Jacob over his twin brother Esau before they had done anything good or bad. Chooses Jacob and Jacob is born and literally, hey, where's my kids ministry kids? Can y'all help me out? I need y'all to tell me this morning what Jacob's name means. Trickiness, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I like that. Trickster, deceiver, cheater. Okay, this is what Jacob's name means. And there's the pattern of his life where this is just playing out. He manipulates his brother from the birthright. He deceives his father and takes the blessing. Esau wants to kill him, chases out of town. He goes out of town as with Laban for 20 years, way longer than he should have been there. But in the meantime, he does uh, have a marriage. Oh, wait, he has two marriages. Oh, wait, there's about four different people involved in this. He has 11 kids and all this mess, yet God is still using him, forming the tribes of Israel, 11 sons born in that time. Finally, he knows it's time to leave and he gets mad enough at Laban because Laban deceives him again. So he leaves, but he doesn't tell Laban where he's going. He deceives Laban again. So you see this continued pattern in his life of being a trickster, a manipulator. Laban chases him down. They kind of have it out with one another. And finally, there's this really oath made that essentially leads to them going their separate ways. And Jacob is gonna put that chapter of his life, thank goodness, behind him. He puts Laban behind him and he's going back to Canaan where he belongs and the land God has promised. But there's somebody he needs to meet with before he gets there. And it's the one who wants to kill him. It's his brother Esau. So that's where we pick up in chapter 32. I would ask you if you would stand in honor of God's word of recognizing, hey, that is the word that we're focused in on. In Genesis chapter 32, we'll read verses one through eight. This is the word of the Lord. Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, female servants. I've sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. And Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will 
escape. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you pursue us, that you came to seek and to save the lost. Lord, I pray that you would grip us like you grip Jacob in this text and wrestle us until we know our desperation for you, Lord. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I've titled our time in this text today, Victory Through Surrender. Victory through surrender. And if you're, if you're taking notes and kind of wondering organizationally how we're gonna walk through the text, I wanna walk through this passage in three scenes in the narrative. The first is that God corners Jacob. He puts him in a situation where he ends up pretty desperate. He corners him, God's gonna wrestle him, and then finally God's gonna break him and rename him. And so that's how we'll progress through this story. But picking up first with this scene where God begins to corner him in a position where he has nowhere to go. In chapter 32, verse one, things start out really good in the narrative. It says Jacob is going on his way. Remember, he's traveling away from Laban and the angels of God met him. This is the first time he's had a dramatic moment of revelation like this since 20 years prior. You remember as he was fleeing, he is heading to Haran where Laban was and he had that whole Jacob, the, the ladder experience where the ladder was uh, down making that bridge between heaven and earth and God was showing his control and presence and governance of all things. Now going back towards Canaan, he has this dramatic moment of revelation again. And I think this is a huge confidence builder because he says, this is God's camp. And he calls the name of that place and remember this, what he calls it, Mahanaim. Mahanaim, it means two camps. Jacob recognizes in this moment, whoa, the Lord is with me. I have some serious confidence right now because there are two camps. There's my camp and then there's the Lord camp and they are with us. Really, no, he is with them, but never mind. You know what I'm saying. But there's this confidence. How much more in the new covenant? If you believed in Jesus Christ, there's not two camps. There's one camp and it's the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And don't you just love it when you walk away from a time when God's worked dramatically in your life or he's convicted you in his word or he's done something amazing and your eyes are on him and you're ready to like storm the gates of hell with that water pistol. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like it doesn't matter. Just got dumb courage. And then life hits. And all of a sudden, as great as your revelation of God was, it's like he completely ceased to exist in your mind the next moment. Jacob sends some messengers off to basically kind of gauge, how's this thing gonna go with Esau? Because he kind of hated me. In verse six, it says, the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. This is probably the standard size of a militia in the ancient Near East. This is, this is not good news, okay? And so he's doing what I think any of us would do. He's freaking out taking his eyes off the king and he's just consumed now with this problem in front of him that he doesn't know how it's gonna go and the Lord really is beginning to corner him. It's like trying to get a roach in the corner of your house, except you're not trying to, he's not trying to stomp him, he's trying to save him. That's a bad illustration, but you know what I'm saying. He's cornering him. He's putting him in a situation where he has nowhere to go and you know this is exactly the way the Lord works, does he not? This is what he does at the Red Sea. He gives them nowhere to go. This is what he does at the wall of Jericho, those impenetrable walls. He gives them no way in. This is what he does with Goliath. This is what he does when you're dead in your sin. To put you in a position so you know, whoa, I'm absolutely dependent upon the Lord to work. That's where he is moving Jacob, but Jacob doesn't get it yet. And all the discipline and consequences of Jacob's sin, he's still learning what it looks like to walk with the Lord. And this is gonna be one of the biggest moments of his life. Verse seven is in, in his fear and his distress. Look what he does. It says, he divides the people who were with him, the flocks and herds, the camels into, notice it again, this is important, two camps. What did he just call the place? Two camps. Now he's divided his people into two camps. And we're invited to see what he's thinking twice in this narrative. Two times, Moses tells us what he's thinking. He's thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. He doesn't have his eyes, Colossians 3, 2, on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He has his mind on the things of the earth. 
And when you begin to get your mind on earthly problems and to try to develop earthly solutions, there's gonna be problems. He divides the camp because he thinks this is gonna strengthen his position. He already had two camps. That's the whole point. He called it Mahanaim because there were two camps. He had the strength of his family and God's camp with him, but he's forgotten that. So he's dividing his people up. And what he's actually doing is he's weakening his position because he's moving away from a trust of the Lord. But then look at this, verse nine, he prays. He prays. It's a little late, don't you think? But again, why am I so frustrated that he's just now praying? Because this is how I operate, I think, a lot of time too. I wait until I try to figure out everything in my own human strategy and my own methods. And then when everything's not working out, then, well, I guess we can go ask God. Nevertheless, it's good he's praying. It's good you pray no matter when it happens. If you're calling out to God in faith, in verse nine, Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham and God of my father, Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all of the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you've shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I've crossed this Jordan and now I've become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. Note that he fears Esau, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, talking about what the Lord promised him, I will surely do your good, do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. This is honestly a really faithful, theologically accurate prayer. He's calling out to God, verse nine, based on the covenant. Verse 10, he recognizes his desperation, his need for the Lord to work. Verse 11, he petitions God and then he does it Verse 12, based on the very promises God has given. So this is really good. You see this growth in Jacob. You know, this is the first time since Genesis 25 when Jacob appeared that he's ever prayed in scripture, at least. So there is a growth right here, but at the same time, as soon as he prays, he goes back to his earthly methods. George Mueller, very man famously known for prayer years and years ago in England was once asked, Mr. Mueller, what's the most important part of prayer? And to make a point, he said about his own faith, he said, well, typically the 15 minutes following when I say amen. And here's the evidence that it's possible for you to know all the language, all the promises, be able to articulate, even pray truth, but not step into surrender to it. What happens in verse 13 through 18 is that he starts with his human strategy again. He begins sending out servants with gifts. Okay, so here that, this is how this is gonna work. He gets up from prayer. He's like, we gotta figure something out to please my brother Esau because I know this dude is ticked off, okay? So here, he takes a group of servants and he puts, gives them a bunch of gifts and he sends them on ahead. Then he waits an hour. Then he takes another group with some more gifts and he sends them. He does this three or four times and he's thinking, okay, Surely, with each successive reception of gifts from my brother Esau, by the time that I get there, I'm gonna be on his good side. But what's sad about this whole thing is it's completely unnecessary. Because if you jump to chapter 33, what you're gonna find is that God places favor for Jacob upon Esau. None of this is necessary. But this is what happens when your mind is set on the flesh, when your mind is set on your own human strategy and not upon dependence upon the Lord, you're gonna waste your possessions, you're gonna waste your time, and you're gonna freak out all for nothing when it's not even necessary. Can anybody resonate with that? This is my life. But again, we're told what he is thinking. In verse 20, it says this. He's speaking to his servants about these gifts. He says, moreover, you shall say, your servant Jacob is behind us. This is what they're supposed to say to Esau. For, listen to what he's thinking. He thought. That's where we always start messing up is when we do our thinking for ourselves, you know? He thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him and he himself stayed that night in the camp. He fears Esau. He wants to appease Esau. He wants to see the face of Esau. He wants the acceptance of Esau. You see anything wrong here? Everything ought to be flipped over 
It's the Lord he ought to fear. It's the Lord that you and I need to fear, not man. He ought to be after the Lord's face. He ought to be after the Lord's favor and the Lord's acceptance. He's got everything backwards. And what he's about to figure out is his problem is not Esau. His problem is not Esau, as fearful as it is before him. His problem is what he thinks to be the solution to this moment and every moment that has led up to this point in his life. He thinks himself to be the solution. Maybe that's where you find yourself today in a position of brokenness, in a position where you feel cornered and there's all this stuff going around you. And what the Lord would always reveal to us is our problems are not primarily what's in front of us. Our problem is when we think that we're the solution, our eyes have not yet been fixed. We just talked about behold the lamb. They've not yet been fixed upon Christ. And you see him still withholding. Verse 22 says, the same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream. Notice this, he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had and Jacob was left alone. It's kind of crazy because Jacob is surrendering everything. He sent his servants, he sent his family, he sent his children, he sent all of his possessions, but there's one who hadn't yet crossed the river. It's him. There's still a withholding of his own obedience. What are you withholding this morning? What are you withholding in obedience and surrender to the Lord? God has him cornered. He can't go back to Laban in the past. He's scared to move forward and surrender in the future and move across the river because of his brother Esau. But the Lord is about to have his heart. What are you withholding? God corners him, but he doesn't stop there because the Lord in his grace is unrelenting. He wrestles him. Verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. This is one of the weirdest stories in scripture. Anybody ever read the Bible and you say, this is weird. This is odd. It's supposed to be. It's how it gets our attention. <laughs> I mean, he's just out there in the middle of the night chilling by the river, probably pacing back and forth in fear. And all of a sudden, somebody grips hold of him in the dark. He can't see who it is. Somebody assaults him, grabs hold of him, gets in this grappling match with him. He doesn't know who it is. He doesn't know if it's Esau's men. He doesn't know what's going on, but he's in a wrestling match. And he doesn't know it's the Lord. We know, because we have all, we have all the scripture. Isn't that nice? We know this is God, who in some way is manifest himself in human form. Hosea talks about this is the angel of the Lord. God has manifested himself in a human form to some degree, and he's wrestling with him. You know, sometimes I just think we need to let the scriptures reshape how we view God. Not sometimes, we need to do this all the time. Because I think a lot of times in the American West, we can decide, you know, God's kind of this distant deity. He's uninvolved in the events of history and he's impotent and he's really not willing to make anyone uncomfortable. The Lord is a warrior pursuing the hearts of his people. He straight up assaults Jacob in this passage, grabs hold of him and he wrestles him. He wrestles him. I think this is very important. So many times I've heard this text taught and people will say, we are supposed to wrestle God for his blessing. That's not what this passage is about. It is not good that God is having to wrestle Jacob. They're not supposed to wrestle God for his blessing. He's not wrestling God. It says the man wrestled him. He's wrestling Jacob. The Lord pursues you. He pursues us. And this moment is not just unique in his life right now in the bout of wrestling. Any of y'all ever wrestled? It's exhausting. Any you ever wrestled for just a minute? Feels like you ran a marathon. He's wrestling all night. But this is indicative of his entire life with the Lord. There's been a pattern of this since God called him where he's been stubborn, refusing obedience, refusing surrender, one step after another. God's gone after him, but he's walked away. This is his life as a whole. Maybe you're hearing that, you say, wow, that sounds like me. Surely we can all resonate with this to some degree. The moments of stubbornness where we've stiffened our necks to what the Lord has called us to 
And, and you know what's most astounding about this is Jacob doesn't know that it's God. You kind of look back at this text and say, how do, you, how do you not know this is God? But isn't this in the case of our life? Usually when God's wrestling us, we don't recognize it's him at first. We think it's everything going on around here. And all of our emotional, psychological, spiritual turmoil, we think this is the problem, that's the problem, that's the problem. When in reality, God has grabbed hold of us and saying, would you look upon my face? Why is God wrestling him? It's because God in his grace is aggressive and determined. He's called him and he is going to deliver him. Isn't this good news? Yet, I think it's better not to have this disposition to the Lord. It's better just to go ahead and surrender on the front end because God's saying, Jacob, okay, you know, you belong to me. You're not gonna surrender. Step on the mat. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Step out on the mat. We'll see how long that you last. We'll see how long that you go in the ring. You know, in, uh, in our lives, there's all kinds of things that we're, we, we come up against and we say, you know what? I'm not even gonna try. I'm gonna lose. But somehow we still end up doing them. I remember in middle school, this one football tournament we played in, we got out of the cars and got out on the field and those dudes all had beards and I was freaking out. We're about to lose this game. This is about to go bad. Same way, I was, you know, this was just a few years ago. You think I would learn from instances like this. A few years ago, I found myself in one of our church members' houses. I'm not gonna disclose his name, but he may very well be pretty high level in martial arts. How I ended up in this situation, I don't know, but I'm on the mat. I'm across from him and somebody's yelling ding, ding, ding. I'm looking at him. I'm looking at his strength. I'm looking at his credentials. I'm looking at his experience. This isn't gonna work out. And where do I find myself? Well, bent over on the floor in a headlock, can't breathe, tapping out. Why do we do this with the Lord? Do we not know his credentials? Yet so often in my life, I have heard from him and then turned and done the exact opposite of what he's told me. Why do we contend with almighty God, knowing his eternal nature, his divine power and his goodness? Aren't you glad though, that we have the kind of savior who took on flesh to wrestle our souls? that he loved us enough to grab hold of us. Zechariah 3 says to pluck us from the fire because we will go down the wrong road if left up to us. God corners him, God wrestles him, but God has to break him to rename him. Verse 25, pay very close attention to this part of the text because I think it can be confusing. It says, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. He touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. This is probably one and one of the only heavenly tap outs you're gonna see in scripture, so I hope you see it. It says he didn't prevail. The man, that's talking about the Lord. It's easy to get, who, which pronoun, which third person pronoun is he using right here? He's talking about the Lord. The Lord saw he did not prevail against Jacob. Let's first talk about what this does not mean. This does not mean that God's saying, I can't win. This is again, indicative not only of this moment, but it's indicative of Jacob's entire life. He saw he did not prevail, meaning he sees that through everything he's done so far, Jacob still is going to stubbornly refuse the Lord's will. That's what it means. It's very clear in what he does next that he has no problem winning this wrestling match if he wants to because all he does is take his hand and lay it on Jacob's hip and boom, out of socket. I think Jacob likely in this moment knew that this wasn't any kind of normal person. You know, we last week we talked about the Lord's discipline and the life of Jacob The point of discipline is to yield holiness. It's for us to obey him. It's really interesting if you read the end of Hebrews 12 and that section talking about discipline, the text says, in response to God's discipline, therefore lift your drooping hands and make straight paths for your feet. So respond to God and surrender. 
so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Has anybody ever been broken by the Lord? I wish I could hold up a hundred hands for the number of times the Lord has had to bring me low so that I might know who he is and his love for me. But isn't he good? Isn't he good to grab him, to touch his hip? Because look at what he's about to work. Verse 26, the man says, that is the Lord said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, I think this is where this text gets misconstrued. It might seem like Jacob is making a demand of God. I assure you that he is not. Up on the screen, I want you to look to Hosea chapter 12. Years later, we're literally given commentary on what happened in this text. Speaking of Jacob, it says, in the womb, he took his brother by the heel. In his manhood, he strove with God. It's sharing about not only Jacob individually, but the nation of Israel and God's people as a whole. There's this pattern of resistance throughout their history, this pattern of stubbornness. In verse four, it says, he strove with the angel and prevailed. That's great news. He won. How did he have the victory? What's the next thing say? He wept and sought his favor. He wept and sought his favor. He said, God, how he said this is important. This wasn't a demand. This was a plea for mercy. God, I will not let you go until you bless me. How did he prevail? How did he have victory? Through surrender. He didn't wrestle God and obtain the blessing. God wrestled him to bless him. He didn't master the Lord. The Lord mastered him. And he said, Lord, please, I'm not leaving until you bless me. And you see in this moment such something so break in Jacob's heart and break in Jacob's spirit that his resolve completely flips over. And it switches from a resolve to resist obedience and resist surrender to the Lord to a resolve to cling to the Lord for the very mercy that he knows he needs. And Jacob gets it. Jacob gets it. Because the man says to him, what is your name? And you know this, y'all. When God starts asking questions, he's never lacking information. He's not lacking for any of He's not wondering, oh, you know, Jacob, I forgot your name. No, when the Lord asks questions, especially like this in the Garden of Eden, Adam, where are you? What's he actually looking for? Confession. In this brokenness, there's an opportunity for confession. And this is crazy. He has one word to say. And I think this one word represents the ownership of his entire life. What is your name? Jacob. Trickster, deceiver, manipulator, sinner. Lord, I'm wrong. You know in your life, you have to reach this point if you want a relationship with Jesus Christ. That the Lord comes to you and says, who are you? And you say, Lord, I don't have anything left. I'm guilty. I'm sinful. I'm broken. I have no strength on my own to earn your favor. I have no strength, Lord. I'm completely broken. This is who I am. The only thing that we can bring before the Lord is our sin. But man, look at what the Lord does. He said, your name, look at this mercy, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Who does God say that Jacob is now? No longer Jacob. Is he gonna act like Jacob again? 100%. Are you gonna act like yourself again when God gives you a new name? Yes, probably. <laughs> Yet God gives this name 
for Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. It's kind of a hard name to translate, to be honest, but there is this connotation of Jacob's strivings with the Lord, but also I think the Lord's striving for him. It's ambiguous. I think it can be taken either way. But what we see is God place this complete new identity upon him. Your name shall be called Israel. This is the story of what Jesus has come to do. But you gotta be broke first. Not just at the moment of salvation, but every day there has to be a brokenness of your neediness for the Lord and recognizing this is what Jesus has come to do. To wrestle your soul into a position of brokenness by the power of the Holy Spirit until you recognize it is he and he alone who can change your life. Is he and he alone who can take away your sin? The gospel of Jesus Christ is about new identity. The blood of Jesus Christ shed at the cross for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus has died. I want you to hear it. He has died for sinners. He has paid the penalty for sin and been raised from the dead to give identity. But you have to die. Jacob, I think, had to die in this moment. You and I, we had, there has to be a death. Galatians 2 says, we must be crucified with Christ. The death of the old man that we might receive what the Lord wants to bless upon us. And he does it freely. Jesus does this in the entire New Testament. Simon confesses, uh, confesses Jesus as the Christ. And he says, Simon, no longer will you be called Simon. From now on, you will call Peter. For on this rock, I will build my church. He blinds Saul and breaks Saul and humbles Saul, whose name literally meant proud. And he says, no longer shall your name be called Saul. Your name shall be called Paul. And it means little. And the Lord wants to do it in your life. And some of you here need to experience that today for the first time. To be renamed by Jesus Christ through the forgiveness of sins. He wants to give you freely this new identity by his grace, through his death, through what he has worked, through what he has paid for. Will you receive it? Or maybe today you just need to be reminded of who you are and who you belong to. Jacob asked him, verse 29, please tell me your name. He said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. I think the Lord's saying, you already know who I am. I don't need to answer that question. And Jacob clearly got the picture because Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. He sought out to seek the face of Esau, but he got somebody completely different. What if the brokenness in your life right now, you're seeking all the wrong faces when the Lord wants you to look upward and to see his what he wants to do in you, what he wants to change in you. He says, I called the name place Peniel saying, for I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. You understand that if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have lived to see the face of God and tell the tale. Second Corinthians four verse six says, God who said, let light shine into the darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You understand this is why the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus alone is supreme. It's why it's in the name of Jesus alone there is forgiveness of sin in his cross. It's because in looking to him and him alone, the way, truth, and the life, are you and I going to behold the face of God? to behold his face, to experience his grace, his mercy, all freely. I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been delivered. Man, is that good news. To know Jesus Christ and be able to walk away and say, I've experienced the presence of God, yet I'm alive. I have eternal life because of Jesus Christ. I'm secure in Christ. I'm forgiven in Christ. There is no condemnation in Jesus for those who are in Jesus Christ. But it says the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel limping because of his hip. It's better for you to limp with the love of God than to walk in swagger and pride and to forsake his promise. Has the Lord broken you, cornered you, wrestled you, 
will you recognize that he desires your mind, your attention, and your heart? And will you concede and surrender that you might have victory in his name? He wants to give it to you by his grace. He loves you. Would you pray with me? Father, you are good to us and that we could take on the name of your son is incomprehensible, Lord. Thank you for we are sinful and wretched yet by the blood of Jesus, we are covered and we cling to him. Lord Jesus, we cling to you right now and I pray in this room, Lord, you would bring salvation. Lord, you would bring renewal. You would bring reminder to your people of their name that you have given through your grace. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.